Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an independent educational grant from Siemens Health and Ears. Hello, I'm Michael Charlton, and I'm a practicing hepatologist and a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago, where I serve as director of hepatology. Welcome to this program titled Earlier Detection of Liver Fibrosis Outside of the Hepatology Clinic. Joining me today is my colleague Celeste Thomas, who is a practicing endocrinologist and assistant professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. Welcome and thank you for joining our program today, Celeste. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So there are three things that we want to cover today specifically. The first is why endocrinologists need to assess uh, liver fibrosis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, the second is how endocrinologists can screen for liver fibrosis in their endocrinology and diabetology clinics. And then finally, how gastroenterologists and endocrinologists work together. Well, as we set off, I wanted to start by highlighting why it's important to be thinking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this is a slide from the National Institute of Health uh, NASH Clinical Research Network, which is a multi-center academic study perspective analysis of outcomes uh, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And on the left-hand side of the, the slide, you'll see overall or all-cause mortality according to fibrosis stage. And fibrosis stage can really be trichotomized into fibrosis stages 0, 1, and 2. This is mild fibrosis. Nobody has any important medical manifestation of these earlier stages of fibrosis. Fibrosis stage three is bridging fibrosis. Fibrosis stage four is cirrhosis. And you see that all cause mortality, not just liver mortality, is markedly increased as you go up through the fibrosis stages. So bridging fibrosis and cirrhosis, F3, F4, has about a six-fold and three-fold increase in all cause mortality. And on the right-hand side, which is for liver-related clinical events, so encephalopathy, ascites, hepatocellular carcinoma, need for liver transplant, et cetera, uh, these go up even more. So the likelihood of having uh, any liver-related event is about 60-fold higher uh, if you have F4 and about 20-fold higher if you have F3. And almost nothing happens if you're F0 or 2. So one of our primary purposes and one of our roles in our endocrinology and hepatology clinics is to try and figure out which of these categories of risk uh, is a patient in. So the, who is at risk for liver fibrosis? Uh, so Celeste, how and why do we need to identify patients at risk for developing uh, fibrosis? Well, what we're learning in our endocrinology clinics is that our patients are developing fibrosis, but we have been missing some patients who then develop NASH cirrhosis. And so in the endocrine clinic, we want to think about um, doing some simple, maybe non-invasive tests to identify those patients with type 2 diabetes who are at risk. In addition, we have other patients that we're seeing in our clinic who are um, at risk. So those with polycystic ovarian syndrome, those uh, with hypogonadism, those with adult growth hormone deficiency, potentially from a history of pituitary disease, are also at risk. Well, uh, conveniently, the American Association for Clinical Endocrinology recently collaborated with the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease to generate a, a set of guidelines, some algorithms that can be followed in the clinical setting to help, help practitioners navigate uh, through evaluation and management of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So on the left-hand side of this, the uh, ACE uh, group has really come up with what they feel are patients who are at higher risk for having non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which may be more advanced. And they have uh, three settings that they highlight, particularly prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, obesity, uh, particularly if they have up to you know, two or more uh, cardiometabolic risk factors, so for example, dyslipidemia, hypertension, et cetera. 
and then hepatic steatosis with elevations in transaminases. And this is important, I think, up to this point. In most endocrinology practices, people have relied upon transaminases to screen for people, as at least as an initial sense that uh, somebody may have liver inflammation. So that's, has that been fair, do you think, that uh, in endocrine practices, uh, reliance on transaminases has really been the primary method up to this point? I think that's right. I think seeing an elevation in the transaminase is the one thing that triggers um, some consideration for uh, non-alcoholic Seattle hepatitis versus other uh, processes. And when you have a, a patient with, uh, let's say, normal transaminases uh, and say two or more of the cardiometabolic factors with uh, a BMI of over 30, how do you feel they're being managed? Are those patients going through the algorithm? Were they getting some sort of non-invasive testing? Or are they, up to, in many practices, just being uh, left as being not likely to have liver disease? What's your sense of that? Well, my sense of the current practice, and you know, there's been a call to, to do exactly what's reflected in these new guidelines, um, but it hasn't been the current practice. And so that's why it's important for us to think about how easy it would be to incorporate um, some of those non-invasive scores in addition to reviewing um, those transaminases. There were data just presented recently that of the 100 million people who have fatty liver disease, less than 3% have been seen by hepatologists. So most of them are in endocrinology and primary care uh, practices. So we're going to move forward to start thinking about uh, some of the non-invasive tests that we can use to risk stratify uh, patients or identify patients at more risk, either for having liver disease or for developing it. And the, the winner in terms of simplicity has been something which is widely available because it's present in almost every electronic medical record. And this is something called the FIB4 or the Fibrosis 4 test. And as the name would imply, there are just four components. And they are uh, age, uh, platelets, AST, and ALT. So something almost every patient will have in clinic. And we have our uh, nurses will go into uh, the charts and have this ready for us before we go in uh, and see the patient. So we know the FIB4 as a patient comes to our uh, hepatology and endocrinology part of their visit to the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, clinic. The cutoff values we're going to come back to in just a moment, the prognostic performance, the primary utility of the FIB4 is in identifying people who are unlikely to have significant uh, liver disease. And it's about a 95% negative predictive value. So if you have a FIB4 with a cutoff value of 1.3 uh, or less, those patients are almost certainly fine. They're 95% likely not to have important disease. We also have, for people who have a FIB4 score that is above this 1.3 level, uh, a subsequent test, which includes the enhanced liver fibrosis test or uh, ELF score. So this breaks down the basic tools that uh, we have available to us to uh, screen for significant liver disease. On the left-hand side are the simple ones. So FIB4, it means those easy, readily available things, AST, ALT, uh, age, and platelets. And then AFL fibrosis score that also brings in body mass index uh, and uh, history of uh, diabetes or prediabetes. And then we have the more complex tests. Uh, the one which is approved by the Food and Drug Administration currently uh, is the enhanced liver uh, fibrosis test. And then finally, imaging. And these are most commonly vibration-controlled transit elastography, or VCTE, most commonly Fibroscan, MR elastography, and then a combination of vibration-controlled transit elastography, or Fibroscan, with AST, and that acronym is brought together as the FAST score. And this looks at the, the components of those. So the top left, uh, you'll see the components of the FIB4, just those things that we talked about, age, AST, ALT, and platelet count. The NAFL fibrosis adds in these other simple values as well, BMI, albumin, and impaired fasting glucose. The cutoff has emerged in uh, patients who have been studied in uh, multiple contexts, uh, multiple clinical trials, uh, as well as uh, databases that are outside of clinical trials, including the NIH's uh, NASH Clinical Research uh, Network. And this number of 1.3 has consistently emerged as being useful for identifying patients with a low likelihood of having disease. So if you have less than 1.3, you're, you're pretty good. 
Now there is some age dependency, so that cutoff, if you're above age 65, uh, becomes two. That's very important in, in our practices to remember the cutoff is different depending on a patient's age. And if you have these low scores, advanced disease uh, is excluded. So one of the things is that in endocrinology, we are familiar with the Fib4. Um, and so a question I was going to ask was, tell me more about this ELF. I haven't, you know, we, I've, I've heard um, our hepatologists discuss that, um, but I haven't ordered it myself. What do endocrinologists need to know about this test and, and should we be ordering it and when? Yeah, so it's a relatively small amount of blood required and it measures three components of the collagen or, or fibrosis matrix. And it's P3MP or pro-collagen 3 and terminal peptide, hyaluronic acid and tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase uh, 1. And values for these are then uh, used in a formula that generates a score. The benefits of this test I'm going to uh, highlight in, in a, uh, with a couple of slides. So this, uh, this slide shows results from uh, a substantial phase three study in patients with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, hepatitis, more advanced. These are patients with bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis, and they were followed for 42 months, and they had ELF score at baseline. The top line that you see here is for patients who had an ELF score uh, of less than 9.8, and the uh, Y-axis in this instance is survival uh, without progression to cirrhosis. These are patients who had bridging fibrosis at baseline in this particular graphic, and then subsequently uh, may have developed uh, uh, cirrhosis. And you see that the ELF score at baseline was highly predictive of development uh, of cirrhosis. So if you had an ELF score of 9.8, your risk was vanishingly small. It was a three-fold hazard ratio if you had an ELF score of greater than uh, 9.76, rounded up to 9.8. And this turned out to be more predictive than baseline histology, so even better than a biopsy for predicting subsequent progression to cirrhosis. This piece of inf information was central to the package that was submitted to the Food and Drug Administration to review and ultimately approve this test uh, for use clinically. The second thing that ELF score uh, predicts is a uh, risk of subsequent clinical event. And you'll see in this case, the cutoff is a little bit different. So for 11.3, uh, if you have less than this number, very low likelihood of developing uh, a clinical event. So with these, these liver-related events, which would include, of course, ascites, encephalopathy, variceal bleeding, liver cancer. Uh, et, et cetera, or listing for liver transplantation. And if you were greater than 11.3, that's where almost all of the clinical events occur. So this is why ELF score is attractive. It tells you your likelihood of having more advanced disease uh, and of developing a liver-related clinical event. And a single unit change in ELF score is associated with a doubling of the risk of liver-related outcomes. So this gives us some uh, dynamic aspects uh, to the test. So changing ELF score uh, may be predictive uh, of improved uh, likelihood of getting uh, cirrhosis or liver-related events. So, so if you look at those three blue boxes on the left, so prediabetes, type 2, obesity uh, with cardiometabolic risk factors, and then transaminase is uh, being elevated with steatosis. What portion of patients do you feel in your practice uh, have one or more of these uh, features? Well, you know, we have these um, dual epidemics. So even our patients who don't have type 2 diabetes, perhaps we're seeing them for their thyroid disease and they do have carry excess weight. And so a good percentage of our patients will have um, type 2 diabetes um, and obesity. You know, with so many patients who fall into the, these categories, it's nice that the algorithm is, is pretty simple. So if you have a patient with these risk factors, the recommendation is to calculate the FIB4 score. You will almost certainly have the information you need uh, to do that. Either you can do it on your, your uh, phone or you can get the EMR to do it uh, for you. Uh, there's uh, several sites that have uh, the formula available for you just to punch in the numbers on your smartphone, for example. If you don't have it, it's something the EMR will generate uh, for you. So once you have a uh, FIB4 score, it'll be one of these three basic categories, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And anyone who's greater than uh, this 1.3 level should move forward to have either a, a fiber scan, a vibration-controlled transient elastography. This equipment is reasonably widely available, but I'm going to say most uh, settings won't have it 
within their clinic. And another option, of course, is this enhanced liver fibrosis test, a blood test that you can order. And that will come back in one of three levels, up to 7.7, uh, between 7.7 and 9.8, which is intermediate risk, and greater than 9.8 is the high risk. So anyone who's above the 7.7 should be referred to hepatology for further evaluation and management. Some of those patients may get liver biopsy, they may get magnetic resonance, elastography, you really want those patients with above 7.7 .7 to be evaluated in a hepatology uh, practice. So that's, is this something that you're finding useful? Are you getting more comfortable with this algorithm? Is, or is it too fresh to really be something that you don't have to refer to directly? Yeah. You know, we actually, um, in our uh, collaborative clinic, our multidisciplinary clinic, we just had a patient whose endocrinologist went through this process. And so previously, um, we were seeing people, you know, based on that imaging or based on that FIB4, but um, we just had a colleague who calculated that FIB4 and then ordered um, the fibro scan and then based on the results of the fibro scan referred to, to the clinic. And so I think it's, it's working. The patient understood what was happening, you know, why they were there and what, they're, what um, they were hoping to learn from that visit. Well, that's good. This already making some impact in, in terms of being uh, uh, taken up by, by practicing endocrinologists. That's good to hear. So would you like to share your key takeaways uh, for us, uh, for our learners today as we come to a close, please, Celeste? Yes. Well, you know, we know that NAFLD is linked to the epidemics of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, endocrinologists can identify individuals in their clinics who are at risk for progression to advanced liver disease and then work with our hepatology colleagues to actually avert or delay progression, which, is an, which we're con considering as another complication of diabetes and obesity. Um, Non-invasive scores that are easily calculated in the electronic medical record can help us efficiently screen our high-risk patient population and understand who's at risk for, for advanced disease as we proactively you know, select those medical therapies that are associated with weight loss, and improved cardiometabolic health. Well, Celeste, I'd like to thank you for this informative and clinically uh, useful discussion, which I've enjoyed very much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it as well. And also, I'd like to thank you for participating in this activity. So please continue on uh, to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation. Thank you once again for being with us today.